I will now get started because this took, um, took up some time. So I'll get started by discussing why we want to look at taxes when we discuss uh, poverty minimization and inequality. So the starting point is high inequality in developing countries. And I guess that for the audience of this conference, I don't have to justify that any further. So this is a, an observation that we have. And um, uh, we think that uh, regardless of what is the underlying cause of inequality in, the, in a developing country, there are a few things that the country, uh, that the government can do to actually influence that. And typically the only really direct way that you can immediately impact on inequality and poverty, the income distribution is to use redistributive taxes and transfers, as well as public good provision. And um, in developed countries, these are of course already quite widely used, but in low-income countries, uh, they are still um, in a way in their baby years that they are getting started and being developed, but they still often consist of uh, perhaps isolated individual um, programs that um, need to be upgraded towards a more holistic, uh, comprehensive systems of taxes and benefits that address these issues. So, and, and this is then what we want to do. We want to characterize what would a uh, tax and transfer system for a developing country look like. Um, so we consider redistribution, therefore we have a labor income tax, commodity taxes, in the revenue side, and we use them to finance cash transfers and public provision of different kinds of goods. And we do this uh, by using the optimal tax theory framework initiated by Murray Leeson, which is uh, basically the core of the public finance literature. It has been used widely, but mainly for the developed country context. Um, and what we want to do is to to depart from some of the assumptions in there or the starting points to make it more <coughs> applicable for a developing country context. The first thing is um, that usually this literature considers nonlinear taxes, meaning that income tax is progressive. It's different, uh, different size of tax for different incomes. <coughs> and these might be difficult to implement in a poor developing country that doesn't have uh, that high uh, administrative capacity and tax collection systems are not that developed yet, so we, uh, we think that in this case it makes sense to restrict yourself to a linear income tax. So a flat rate tax that applies the same to everyone, and also the benefits are universal. And in this we follow the, the literature, the, the few literature that there is on linear taxes, however this, as a whole this optimal tax framework on non-linear and linear taxes, they consider as the objective function, the maximization of social welfare. And this is another point where we want to wish to depart. Um, the reason is that we want to consider uh, different types of objectives that are um, perhaps more suitable for a developing country, but also more uh, reflect the policy discussion that there is. And I think that the opening keynote by Minister Marcelo Neri was a, an excellent um, example of this, that he said that in Brazil there is an ex, um, explicit objective to cut down poverty. So we want to take this into the model and see how it impacts on the tax characterizations. And we, there is also a more general non welfare literature, meaning that you uh, depart from the welfare maximization literature, and we take this poverty minimization is, um, um, is a kind of a special case, a, a more um, detailed case of being, being non welfare and we follow the literature on that, and you can see that my co-authors have already been active in this field. But this would be the first time that we consider a linear income tax and with this poverty minimization objective, and also we want to have this more comprehensive tax system approach. And a quick preview of the results, where we are heading with this, is that we compare the tax results between welfare maximization and poverty minimization, and we find that some of the results actually do, do change, so that it matters what the objective is. One thing is that the tax rules become more sensitive to, the, to labor supply impacts, and another thing is that we find that with commodity taxes, we actually wish to... Uh, we prefer differentiated commodity taxes, so different size of taxes to different commodities. Um, but first I'll have to show you a bit of something about the model to, to introduce these results a bit better. So I proceed in parts that first um, we have the simplest case with just the income tax and the benefit, and then we add public provision and then commodity taxes. In the end, if I have time, I will quickly um, 
describe what kind of applications we might consider for this uh, model in the future. But I will now focus on the on the results, and I, given the time, I of course have to be quite superficial, and I try to convey the intuition behind the results. First, though, the structure of the model. Uh, so the government has different instruments, the linear income tax tau, and then the lump sum benefit B. So both the, the uh, tax is, a, is a, the tax per percent, so it's the same share of income for each individual, a flat rate tax, and the benefit is universal, so it's for everybody, and it's lump sum that everybody gets it in the same size as well. And then we add public provision G and commodity taxes T in later parts of the model. We have a discrete model with n individuals uh, who are denoted with the superscript I, and then their labor income is denoted with Z, and consumption is equal to disposable income, so this is the after-tax income uh, of their uh, labor income, and then plus the benefit B. Uh, individuals, of course, maximize their utility and, and behave accordingly, but then we consider different objectives for the government. The first is the benchmark case, the standard social welfare maximization, where we maximize some kind of a, some of um, some of these individual utilities, indirect utility functions V, or with some transformation function W, and of course we always have the uh, government's budget as the constraint. Uh, then the most general non-welfareist uh, objective function would look something like this. Uh, we have um, any kind of um, function denoted by F here, that is the social evaluation function. So depending on what is the goal of the government, you have a function that evaluates, evaluates that. And in this example, we have consumption and labor income in it. So we might have some ideas about we want to have a reasonable uh, consumption levels for individuals, but also some ideas that everybody should work some, some amount of time. So we may, may have, this may include these kind of paternalistic objectives. But then what we consider uh, in this paper and in this pre presentation especially is this uh, more detailed uh, type of non-welfare in the poverty minimization case. So we define this evaluation function F to be a function what we call a deprivation function, denoted by D. So this compares the individual I's uh, consumption level, CI, to some um, minimum level. That is a subjective assessment, what is the minimum level that the C bar reflects that. So we measure how far below is an individual's consumption of this minimum level C bar. And um, we sum them over all individuals, but we give zero weight to people who are above the, the threshold level, who are considered non poor and as an example, we could use the foster bria thorbeke index uh, described here, uh, but in this presentation, I'll just be uh, a bit more general and use the index D here, and its derivatives just uh, in a, uh, without specifying what the derivatives look like. So with this uh, setup, we can move on to the model. First with the linear income tax and and the benefit. So to, to get started, the benchmark case is the, when we maximize social welfare and find the optimal tax rate. The, the rule looks like this, that um, here in the front we have uh, 1 over E. E is the aggregate labor supply elasticity. And this, works, this gives us the efficiency effect that if people are more sensitive to taxes so that they change their labor supply in response, um, we want to have lower taxes to reduce the amount of distortions. And the second part, in the brackets, we have this omega term, and this term takes into account inequality considerations, uh, such that the more there is inequality, the lower omega is, and because there's a minus sign, this works to um, increase tax rates. So when there's more inequality, we want to collect taxes to finance these benefits for redistribution. Um, so without going into more detail, just to so show you that when we change the objective function to be minimization of poverty, the rule looks similar. It has a similar structure. We have the efficiency effect uh, of the uh, labor supply elasticity here. But then in the brackets we have a different term. And this D tilde is now quite different from the omega term on the previous slide. Uh, well, it, it looks like this, but we don't have to go into detail. 
uh, but it depends on these uh, derivatives of the, of the deprivation index. And there is a direct effect um, over here and, and an indirect effect. So Z is the labor supply and we have its derivative with respect to um, the net of tax rate. So depending on how much people react to uh, how much people change their labor supply behavior given these taxes, um, that, that also impacts on, on their poverty. So this detail that measures the relative efficiency of taxes in deprivation reduction. And actually if we rewrite it in the other way, we can see that because of this um, uh, labor supply effect, we actually have an individual uh, elasticity term here. So in, here in the front, we have the same aggregate elasticity effect as in the welfareistic case but this detail that itself includes this individual elasticity term as well. And this works so that it means that we want to uh, induce the poorest also to work more because we, they are the, the ones whose, um, um, uh, whose consumption needs to be increased the most and whose uh, the deprivation index is the most sensitive to them. So we want to reduce tax rates in order to induce the poor to work more. And even though we have a linear tax, we still want to do this that when we, because um, even though with the linear tax we have to reduce the tax on everybody because we can't differentiate taxes on, on individuals. And uh, an earlier paper found a similar effect with non-linear taxes, but now we find that with, li with a linear income tax we still have the same impact. Okay, so this is what, what I meant with the result that we find that the result taxis are more sensitive to labor supply impacts. And we actually find something similar in that case when we add public provision into the picture. So first, again, the benchmark case for a pure public good. The uh, provision rule looks um, like this. Uh, just quickly that on the, we equate the welfare weighted sum of marginal rates of substitution to the modified marginal rate of transformation. So kind of a modified Sammy Olson rule. On the right hand side, the uh, P is the price of the good, so the direct marginal rate of transformation. And then we have these uh, effects multiplied by tau, the tax rate. So we have, again, tax revenue implications. So these affect how costly it is for the government to provide this good. If providing the good G uh, increases labor earnings on the average, uh, then you have more tax revenue and it's less costly than to provide, relatively less costly to provide the good. And when we uh, change the objective to be deprivation minimization, the, the right hand side says the same, but on the left hand side we again have something different. And here now this D star measures the relative efficiency of the public good in reducing deprivation. So we have the direct impact. Uh, the derivative of the index with respect to the root G. But again, we have an additional indirect impact. So we again have this labor supply um, uh, derivative with respect to the root. So depending on how people react, uh, change their labor supply, their earnings in response, this, uh, this good will also impact on other, good, other, other consumption and therefore we have this um, derivative of the index in here as well. So in this case, too, we are more, more sensitive to these labor supply impacts because uh, they affect people's disposable income and that has an impact on poverty measurement. And uh, I won't have time for this, but just to mention quickly that we can use this model to analyze different types of goods as well. So this was for a pure public good. We can have quasi-private goods such as education or goods that don't directly impact on deprivation but that, um, uh, that uh, can affect people's uh, productivity. So they may, for example, impact on wages, but I won't go through them in this presentation. Then the final case is with commodity taxes. Uh, and in here, I actually, because the, the rules get a bit more versatile, I have to be perhaps even more superficial on them. So I'll just show you quickly what they, what they look like to give you an idea. That on the, in the poverty minimizing tax rule, what's important here is that we find that they again, they of course depend on the on the derivative of the deprivation index. So that means that we're interested in how much do consumption, uh, sorry, uh, how much do we impact on the 
deprivation measure when we change the prices of the goods. So when we change the commodity tax, we change the prices. Sorry, the price is here Q. I should have mentioned that. Um, so we have a direct impact depending on the level of the good and uh, level of the consumption of the good and an indirect impact depending on the, um, on the change of the demand of that good. But um, there are other types of um, interactions here that I won't, won't have time to, to go through. So just quickly, the intuition is that with this, both the welfare risk and poverty minimizing rule, we, the interpretation is quite similar, and they basically tell us that we want to encourage the consumption of goods that poor people consume relatively more compared to, to less poor people, and conversely discourage the consumption of goods that are consumed by, by richer people. And this is because we have a higher highest weight. In the welfare state case, we have high welfare weight on the poor people, and in the poverty minimization case, the the impact on the deprivation index is highest for the poorest people. And in this um, framework, we have this, this uh, result that I referred to, that earlier research has found, this D1079 paper, found that with, when you have a linear income tax, uniform commodity taxes, so having the same tax rate on all goods, is optimal only under some very strict assumptions regarding the preference structure. And when we do the, the same, um, same analysis, we find that even under these same assumptions, uniform taxes are not optimal. So on the contrary, we want to have differentiated commodity taxes, so rather different <coughs> T, Tjs for each good J, then a simple, just the same T for each good. And this, this will then we can use to benefit uh, the poor. And um, obviously then we can have also negative taxes, so uh, subsidies on, on some goods. So this is a an interesting result that our, our model gives us. And then um, quickly to, to summarize what we actually did here in case you got lost in the, in the equations. So when we use this optimal tax framework, uh, we can characterize what kind of, kind of taxes and transfer systems developing countries that want to minimize poverty can, uh, should implement. So we restrict ourselves to, to use the linear income tax and um, uh, and uh, this universal benefit, but then we, we, we see what kind of characteristics these instruments have. And when we illustrate the key results, we find that it actually does matter that we have poverty minimization as the objective rather than the standard social welfare maximization. Uh, we find that there is uh, these, ad these additional indirect impacts on the tax rates via these um, labor supply reactions and we also find that we want to use differentiated commodity taxes um, combined with this linear income tax. And just a, a quick preview that you can also use this model for other types of applications rather than this optimal tax framework. Um, one, one example is informality. Uh, so the informal sector is obviously quite, um, it's well known that it's quite widespread in, in the poorest countries. So this means that uh, not everybody is, for example, registered to pay taxes, or they might their um, their labor income might be informal. That it's not <coughs> the employers don't report this anywhere. Uh, so obviously, if you collect less taxes because not everybody is in the formal sector, you will you can have a, a lower benefit size because of that because you have because tax revenue is lower, and this of course impacts on poverty reduction. And um, uh, however, we think that there are probably some, some more uh, versatile effects. So if, for example, the poorest people are more often in the informal sector, then they are benefited by the fact that they don't pay the taxes, so their disposable income is higher. So that is one thing that you could consider here. And another thing is, uh, for example, low administrative capacity. So if you have lower tax collection capacity, or administrative capacity in the country, some of the tax revenue might disappear in the process. So even though you collect the tax revenue, not all of that is available to, to use for the benefit. For example, if administration is really ineffective or there is corruption that somebody <coughs> just steals the money, then this of course would have an impact on poverty reduction. Yes, but uh, this would be my presentation.
presentation, so um, I thank you for your attention and we'll be asking, uh, answering your questions later.